Ma'am, may I please request you to share your thoughts with us? This is the right moment. Hello, good morning. Such a rare privilege and such an unexpected one. You know, I, I was going to come to Delhi for a couple of lit fests and to speak to older children about my books. And this was completely unexpected. Ashish has uh, had connected me to uh, Lotus International. And the principal, ma'am, said, you know, why, why would you be OK to come and watch our nursery school annual day? Just happens to be ha happening the same day. And we'd love to have you there as, a, uh, as an important guest. And I was like, wow, of course, because my kids are grown up now. And I have forgotten how this felt. But in one hour, I was absolutely transported. And I could feel, <laughs> feel how parents' hearts were swelling and swelling with pride. <laughs> That reminded me of being a young parent, and it was a very lovely, nostalgic trip for me. So thank you very much for having me. Um, and how much things have changed in like 10, 15 years with technology coming in, and so much adding to the whole experience of an annual day. Uh, however, the emotions haven't changed at all. The joy on the children's faces haven't changed at all. The amount of effort the teachers put into it hasn't changed at all. And how the parents cheer their children on and the grandparents, that hasn't changed at all. So I'm, I'm really glad that that has stayed alive. You know, it gives me hope. Uh, because you, you're always in the middle of so much bad news. At least it seems to be as if the world is all going to pot all around you. Yes, this is the purest and it's nice. It's wonderful to see that schools and teachers and parents still nurture those very values that have been treasured in this country for ages and ages. Uh, I mean, I love, the, I love the whole thing about how the pirates, you know, these are ah, hoi mates, my party, shiva me timbers, but in the end, they're like, India, man, India is the place for us. We don't want to go anywhere else. I think that's a very important thing to build pride uh, in who we are. And, you know, I'm not at all surprised that the pirates decided to stay here because people have been coming to this land for thousands of years in search of they don't know what, but they seem to find it here. You know, they just come here to trade, they come here to conquer, they come here to uh, do a, you know, just for adventure, for tourism, and this land swallows them and keeps them and never lets them go. And even when they do go back, they, they go back completely transformed. This, they cannot be untouched by this land. And um, particularly for me, as a children's author, like uh, I was introduced and I've done many kinds of books. I've done fiction and nonfiction. But the books that have, you know, came serendipitously to me because my editor suggested I do it were not the books I would have done if they hadn't been suggested to me. And that book, in fact, has become the most successful of all my books, and it's called The Gita for Children. Until I began to research the book, the, for, you know, for the book, I had never in my life read the Bhagavad Gita. I am Hindu, but I grew up in a family that did not have a single copy of the Gita at home because we come from a different cult of Hinduism that does not uh, you know, revere the Vedas. So that kind of extreme diversity is possible in this religion that is not a religion. It's, just, it's not religious at all, actually. You know, Hindu and Hinduism were new words that have been into, uh, Hinduism particularly is no, no more than 150 years old. The word, it was introduced by the British to divide us. You know, because they couldn't think of, uh, we never presumed to, this is so ancient that it is like well be, before any organized religion was formed in the world. It was well before Christianity came up, well before Islam came up. This is just the wisdom of this land. And it's a completely secular wisdom. But to know that, I had to first explore uh, the Gita. I didn't know that. I always assumed that it was a religious book, because that's what we are told. So, and then later, a few years later, I, earlier this year, another book of mine called The Vedas and the Upanishads for Children came out. And the Upanishad, the, the Gita is basically the essence of all the Upanishadic wisdom. So. I had to go back further in time to find the Upanishads, which are even more secular. I mean, the Rig Veda, which is the oldest extant text we have in this country, actually questions the existence of God. 
It questions the omniscience of a god. You know, every, every culture, every religion, like Africa, Australia, America, uh, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, everybody has their own creation myths. You understand what creation myths are. They have a belief about how the world was created, how the universe was created, why man came to be, what happens after death. These are questions that have uh, engaged and tortured and uh, kept people looking for thousands and thousands of years. Whatever, wherever they come from, whatever race they belong to, these are the questions that have consumed us as humans. And every culture has a different creation myth. Uh, we are perhaps most familiar with the biblical creation myth of Adam and Eve and uh, you know how God made the world in seven days and on the seventh day he rested. So we are familiar with this, but I, I myself wasn't familiar with what was the Indian Vedic creation myth. But when I began to research for that and read the Rig Veda, I discovered that just, you know, they did not have one, but four. It was like, this is a creation myth. You don't like it? Okay, here's another one. You don't like this one? Here's another one. Doesn't, not impressed? Okay, why don't we try this one? And if this doesn't agree with you also, if you don't feel like believing in this, that's fine. Find your own. Because every creation myth, just like everybody's own opinions and beliefs are valid. Every creation myth is valid. In this kind of diversity that we have in this country, to keep that alive, that everybody's opinion is valid. This, has been, this is the knowledge and wisdom that has been handed down to us for thousands of years. And every time we seem to be in danger of losing it, of believing that only some people's opinions and beliefs are more valid than others, you would do well to remind yourselves and your children that actually we come from a culture where a diversity, a multitude of opinions exist in happy harmony. And nobody is saying that you have to do, even the whole, there is no belief system. You're not expected to have faith in something that somebody tells you. You're expected to discover it along the way. Every sage in, uh, in history, in this land, has only said, this is my road map. This is how I got here, but I'm sorry, I, it cannot be yours. Yours, you have to draw yourself. This is just, I'm just giving you some guidance about what obstacles you may find and how I overcame them, but it's really up to you. So one thing is to please encourage your kids and yourself always to question. Because four creation myths, and you know what, that, I don't know, I'm, you're probably familiar with this, there's a sukta called the Nasadiya Sukta, in the Rig Veda, which is one of the creation myths. And it describes one of the ways in which the world was born, uh, according to their imagination. And you know, it's very eerie, but if you listen to that, if you have someone read that out to you with your eyes closed, a translation if you don't understand Sanskrit, it is very, very similar, eerily similar to the Big Bang Theory, the, the notion of how the world was formed. But the last paragraph, or the last stanza of that Nasadiya Sukta says, who knows where it all came from, this creation? How can we be sure? Because even the gods came later. I mean, it acknowledges that the gods came later. And then it says, there's a further twist. Only he knows, he who fashioned it all, or does he? That's how it ends. So this is a culture of doubt, of questioning, of no nothing written in stone. And it's a culture where there are no commandments and no rules. You know, it's, it's a scary thing because that means you're entirely on your own. When you don't have the guardrails of rules to keep you, uh, to keep you um, in, in, one, in, a, in a particular line, it's very scary. But can you also imagine how empowering it is that you can make your own rules? It also let, doesn't let you pass the buck it doesn't let you say, but the rule said, thou shalt not lie, therefore I will not. It asks you in every situation to consider all the, of all the possibilities, all the stakeholders, all the choices, and at that moment decide what is right in that particular situation. Which means you have to be mindful all the time. Uh, and that mindfulness has now come back as a big Western thing, be mindful. Whereas our entire culture is predicated on being mindful, because there are no rules. I mean, I, I, pro I think this is why we have such chaos on our streets. We are not a culture used to following rules. 
it's not told to us that these are the rules that must be followed. So that is one thing. The other thing is uh, from the Gita. You know, you know what happens in the Gita. The Kurukshetra war is about to begin. The Pandavas are on one side, the Kauravas on the other. There are fewer Pandavas than there are Kauravas. And the greatest hero on the Pandava side, Arjuna, he has his best friend, best friend forever, Krishna, as his charioteer. But in that moment when the sun is about to rise and the war is about to begin and the conches have just been blown, Arjuna says to Krishna, you know what, just take me to the center of the battlefield, please. One minute. I just want to make eye contact with all those guys. I want to put the fear of God into them. I want to tell them your angel of doom is coming to get them. And they probably won't be standing by the end of the day. And Krishna says, okay, Arjuna, always the show off. Fine, I'll take you because, you know. So he, says, he takes him to the center of the battlefield. And for the very first time, Arjuna standing there, broad-shouldered, narrow-hipped, golden in the sunrise, he stands there and looks at the enemy for the very first time. And then the greatest warrior in the world has a nervous breakdown. His palms get clammy, the bow slips from his hands, his knees begin to buckle, and he collapses to the floor of the chariot in a complete uh, state of despondency that is clearly visible to both sides, both his side, which is depending on him, and the other side, which is uh, fearful of him. But he's not afraid to do that because he says, in what heaven is there a place for a warrior who kills his own grandfather? You know, how can I lift a bow and set, let fly an arrow against the person who told me, taught me how to pick up a bow in the first place, my teacher. And all this for a piece of unfeeling earth, I cannot do this, Krishna. And Krishna, of course, proceeds then to give him the lecture of his life. You know, 700 verses that we call today, that we today call the Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna gives him all the options. He says, this will happen. He tries everything to make sure that Arjuna stands up and does his dharma. He says, I don't care what you are thinking at this moment or how you're feeling. At this moment, your dharma, as a soldier and as a leader of men and as a king of people and as an upholder of what is right and virtuous, is to fight the enemy and finish them off because this is what you owe to your lineage, to your training, to yourself as a person and to your people. Okay, so this lecture goes on for 700 verses and apparently even the sun stopped to listen, that's why dawn did not break until <laughs> the lecture was finished. And at the very end, and he also shows him his Vishwarupa Darshan, like, you know, I'm not really just your friend, I'm also something bigger, you know, I'm far more impressive. And Arjuna is duly impressed. And at the end, Arjuna, is, Arjuna says, okay, boss, fine, whatever you tell me, I will do. Now just tell me what to do. And that's when the ancient wisdom of India and the wisdom of the Upanishad kicks in, because Arjuna, Krishna says, are you kidding me? You want me to tell you what to do? That's not my job. This is your journey to, f to take, your fight to fight. Whatever decision you're going to take is yours alone. So I would advise you, same thing, for your children and for, don't bring, don't put your opinions into them and don't expect them to do what you want them to do, right? They are creatures in their own right. They are old souls born into young bodies, they have been given into your care and it's a great privilege to bring them up and to see that soul blossom. But don't put your ideas and opinions, sure you can guide them but always present them with both sides. Expose them to a variety of opinion and belief so that they may choose based on their heart what they think is right for them. And that's really the way to be a good parent. Last but not the least, teach them what our ancient scriptures teach us, that the, that the spark of divinity, that Brahman, that's all. There is no word for God in the Upanishads except Brahman. And Brahman is just a genderless, formless concept which just means cosmic energy. So teach them that that divine spark of Brahman that they carry in them is exactly the same spark that every tree, every creature, and every other human being carries in him or her. So you are no better than anybody, but you're also no less than anybody. So definitely teach them this. And so those are those four, I'll end with one of the four Mahavakyas from the Upanishads. So they have these four sort of great pronouncements and one of them, there are four of them, but this one you might have heard. It's called Aham Brahmasmi. 
I mean, how can any how can anything be a religion that is so blasphemous? that says that you are God, I am God, I am that divine energy. The same energy that keeps the planets in its orbit, in their orbits, is what makes me wake up each morning. And so every time your child feels that they are somehow, or you, your child or you, because you know, your children never do as you say, they do what you do. So you have to believe it yourself, uh, that any time you feel you're insignificant, irrelevant, powerless, perish the thought. You may not know this, you may not realize it at that moment, but you are far more powerful, far more courageous, far more capable, and far more compassionate and generous than you imagine possible. So reach for that Krishna within you, and don't settle for being human. Behave like the God that you truly are. Thank you very much.